Hey everybody. So in the last video, we took a look at this worry that sort of utilitarianism was sort of too demanding. In this video, we're going to look at what's been one of the most influential and probably thought to be the biggest concern for utilitarianism. One of the biggest sort of problems that any utilitarian has to try to address. And it's related to actually the impartiality and the sort of questions of justice. So in this video, we'll just briefly review consequentialism and utilitarianism. We'll talk about whether utilitarianism is too impartial, and we'll talk about some of the sort of special obligations people think we have. And then we'll talk about the problem of injustice. We'll talk about impartiality, intrinsic wrongness, and sort of the well-being of the prejudiced. We'll talk about injustice as a sort of means to an end. And then utilitarian sort of replies to this sort of problem. All right. Consequentialism, remember, is this moral theory that says an action's morally required just because it produces the best overall results. Now, one influential and simple version of that theory is act utilitarianism, which says an individual action is morally required if and only if it does more to improve overall well-being than any other action you could have done in the circumstances. So remember, by improving overall well-being, a couple notes to remember is that uh, you add in how it sort of adds to well-being, you subtract how it takes away from well-being, and you do that not just for your own well-being, but for everybody's well-being that's affected to get a overall value. And whichever one leads to the highest net overall value in its consequences, that's the action that is morally required. Although notice, it might only produce bad consequences, but if those bad consequences are less bad than any other action, well, then that would be the morally required one. So you take the lesser of two evils, so to speak. Now, we've already seen that utilitarianism is, in some sense, an impartial moral theory. The idea is it produces moral rules that do not favor any one person's well-being more than another's. Everybody's well-being is taken into equal consideration, is equally morally important. So in some ways, this seems to be a huge advantage of the theory, especially when we look at sort of history. The happiness of the billionaire is no more morally important than the happiness of the refugee. The happiness of a person of one race is no more morally important than the happiness of people of any other race. The happiness of a man is no more morally important than the happiness of a woman. The happiness of a cis heterosexual is no more morally important than the happiness of an LGBTQ plus person. The happiness of a Christian is no more morally important than the happiness of a Buddhist, Jew, Muslim, atheist, etc. This all seems good. We shouldn't have a moral theory favor the preferences of one group over the other in these situations. But some worry that utilitarianism is too impartial. There's a sort of double-edged sword here. As your book claims, it says, morality sometimes seems to recommend partiality. It seems right, for instance, that I care about my children more than your children, that I care for friends more than strangers, more for my fellow citizens than those living halfway around the world. And it also seems right to translate my care into action. If I've saved a bit of money and it could either pay for my son's minor surgery or relieve the greater suffering of famine victims, most of us, most of us will think that it's at least permissible to pay the surgeon. So I'm not required to give it to the famine victims. But to do that is to be partial to the interests of my son. So I seem to be favoring the interests of my son over the interests of the others. Utilitarianism doesn't allow that. It says we have to be impartial. Their interest, their well-being is just as important as the well-being of my son. I can't give special preference to my son in that way. So it rejects the idea that a person, just because he is my son, my dear friend, or my fellow citizen is more deserving of my help and attention. So the fundamental worry here is that it seems as if utilitarianism can't explain what's sometimes called our special obligations. So these are moral obligations that we owe to some smaller group of people due to a special relationship between us, as opposed to the obligations that we owe to all persons simply as persons. So the idea here is, look, I do have some moral obligations to anybody and everyone, but it seems as if because I stand in this sort of father-daughter relationship, father-son relationship with my kids, and I stand in a 
serve uh, sort of intimate relationship with my wife and family, it seems as if I have certain moral obligations to them that I don't have to others because of that sort of special intimate relationship. And it's not clear that utilitarianism can explain why we have those special obligations. So we can call this the sort of special obligations argument. Let's put it in a sort of premise conclusion format. That is, the true moral theory must adequately explain our special obligations. Utilitarianism cannot adequately explain our special obligations to our children, friends, family, etc. Thus, utilitarianism cannot be the true moral theory. All right, now, there's a number of things that a utilitarian might try to say in response. So, one thing someone could say is, look, maybe we're just wrong that we have these special obligations. But another thing a utilitarian could do is they could try to say, look, well, sometimes I'm actually, because of the relationship with my kids and my family and my friends, I know them better, and so I know their needs better, and so I'm in a better position to help them than I, than I am others. And so look, when I am put in a situation where I can either maybe help my own kids sort of study for an exam or something like that versus help another sort of child, a stranger's sort of child sort of study for that exam, is, well, I don't know them as well, so I'm not going to be able to help them as well as I could help my own children. And given that intimate relationship, it puts me in a better position to help so I can do more good by focusing my attention on the people that I know how to help best. But that only goes so far. So, I mean, imagine this situation. Imagine that I'm at a sort of beach and no one else is around, and for some reason, sort of my daughter is out in the water and she's drowning. If I do nothing, she will drown and die. And then I look over at the other side of the lake, and I notice two strangers' children drowning. If I do nothing, they will drown and die. I only have time to either go save my daughter or go save those two strangers' children. Look, in this case, I am in a position to either save one life or save two lives. It's clear that utilitarianism says, look, the best thing I can do is save two lives. And so it looks like I'm morally required to go save those two children. Now, you might sort of say, yeah, but you'll feel terrible that your sort of daughter sort of died. But those two children probably have two parents that care about them just as much as I care about my daughter. And so you have two people that, and in addition, you'll also have more sort of parents and loved ones sort of suffering over the deaths of those two. It seems clear in this case that utilitarianism demands that I help the stranger's children. But you want to know what? First of all, if I was put in that situation, I'm probably going to save my own child first. But here's a sort of critical question. like, Does it seem wrong for me to do so? And most people have the intuition, no, because there's something about that sort of parent-child relationship that gives you a special obligation to your own kin first that would thereby make it permissible. And it looks like utilitarianism can't explain why that would be so. Here's another problem. The emphasis on impartiality leads to another problem. We are to count everyone's well-being equally. But suppose that nearly everyone in a society has a deep-seated prejudice against a small minority group. And suppose further that they use this prejudice to defend a policy of enslavement. Depending on the circumstances, it could be that utilitarianism, in theory, requires slavery in this society. Now, when deciding this matter, we need to take all the harms to the slaves into account, because everybody's well-being counts equally. But we must also consider the benefits to their oppressors. As I said, everyone's interests count equally. Rich or poor, white or black, male or female, so far so good. But also, the ignorant or wise, just or unjust, kind or malicious people. Everyone's interests count equally. And enough, if enough people are sufficiently mean and ignorant and made happy by the suffering of others, then utilitarianism can permit them to impose such suffering. Though such cases are not likely to occur that frequently, they can. And when they do, utilitarianism seems to side with the oppressors. And that seems to be a serious problem for any moral theory. So the fundamental problem here stems from a few important facts about utilitarianism. According to utilitarianism, Morally right action is a means to an end. 
So of maximizing overall well-being or happiness. According to utilitarianism, there's no intrinsic moral rightness or wrongness. So there's nothing that makes an action intrinsically right or intrinsically wrong. All that matters is to what extent it helps achieve this goal, this end goal of maximizing overall well-being or happiness. So respecting people's rights and doing justice are usually morally right, according to utilitarianism, because doing those things is usually the best means to producing better overall consequences. However, as with everything else, so this sort of moral flexibility sort of comes back to haunt utilitarianism. There is nothing intrinsically wrong with violating people's rights or doing an injustice. These are means to an end. And so when we can better achieve that end by violating people's rights or doing an injustice, utilitarianism requires that we do so. So that leads to the argument from injustice. Premise one, the correct moral theory is never going to require us, require us to commit serious injustices. So to seriously violate other people's rights. Now, Maybe the correct moral theory will sometimes require us to do maybe minor injustices, but surely it's not going to require us to do sort of extremely severe injustices, like literally take away people's freedom. Now, utilitarianism sometimes requires us to commit serious injustices. Thus, utilitarianism is not the correct moral theory, since it makes the wrong prediction in these cases. There are some potential replies that a utilitarian can try to give. First, someone could abandon utilitarianism for a form of consequentialism that holds both well-being and justice as intrinsically valuable. So remember, utilitarianism is one version of consequentialism that says what you're trying to maximize, the good consequences, are sort of well-being. But you could say, well, hold on, maybe the problem is utilitarianism. Maybe it's in the view of what is valuable as opposed to consequentialism, a view about where right actions come from. So on this kind of view, someone might say maybe morally right actions are ones that lead to consequences that maximize overall good, where the overall good is a combination of not just well-being, but also justice. Now, the big worry for this, though, is, well, what happens when justice and well-being conflict? What happens when an action increases well-being but decreases justice? Or what happens when one sort of does something just but decreases well-being? How do we adjudicate between those? Uh, at that point, now it's not clear that utilitarian, or sorry, that consequentialism gives us clear advice about what the moral thing to do is and can help us sort of resolve our sort of conflict here. And so, for this reason, not a lot of util sorry, not a lot of utilitarians have well, obviously they haven't abandoned utilitarians, but not a lot of consequentialists have gone this route. Now, another possibility is to try to claim that injustice is never going to be optimific, at least in the long run. So try to argue, look, maybe violating people's rights or sort of committing a severe injustice, maybe it would lead to more good for the short-run current moment. But when you look at the long-run consequence about how that's going to affect society, it's going to lead to worse overall results. Maybe because people will find out about the injustice and sort of rebel, and that's obviously not going to produce very good results. But, look, that seems like a hard reply to give, because surely we can at least come up with some possible situation where, in theory, a severe violation of someone's rights is never going to be found out and is never going to lead to these sort of bad consequences. And so in those scenarios... Utilitarianism is still committed to saying, well, in theory, at that point, <laughs> the morally right thing to do would be to do this severe injustice. So another possibility is just to bite the bullet, that sometimes morality is going to require us to commit severe injustices for the greater good, even though that seems rather unintuitive. And it seems, I mean, to many people, it's not just unintuitive, many people find that sort of atrocious. So someone's going to bite the bullet here and accept that we sometimes have to do serious injustices to do the right thing, they need to work to explain why and make that seem less terrible than it seems. So a couple things they might sort of say here is, look, ordinary beliefs about morality are not infallible. Sometimes we need to adjust our moral beliefs. Secondly, they're going to say, look, 
if you grant a little bit, if you say sometimes we have to be willing to sacrifice justice to maybe make compromises to get sort of better results, well, where do you draw the line? How much injustice are you willing to sort of sacrifice? Well, the utilitarian says maybe the only clear line you can draw is when doing so will produce better overall consequences, better overall well-being. All right, and then the idea is it's only in extremely sort of theoretical cases where doing an injustice, a severe injustice, is going to lead to better results. But maybe our intuitions aren't very reliable in those very sort of hypothetical, far-fetched scenarios since they're so different than the kind of world we actually live in. Maybe we shouldn't trust our intuitions in those cases since they weren't built for those cases. Another possibility is to adopt what's called a rule consequentialism or rule utilitarianism, where on this view, consequences wouldn't directly determine the morality of individual actions. Rather, on this view, consequences directly determine the morality of social rules. So you say, okay, well, what are the rules we could adopt rather than the actions we could take? What are the rules we could adopt such that if everybody were to follow these rules, it would be optimistic for society. We'd get the best overall results by everybody following and adhering to those rules. Well, the consequences decide which rules are morally right or wrong, and then the actions will be right or wrong depending upon if they adhere to those rules. So on this view, it's still consequences that determine morality, but consequences are connected to individual actions through this sort of indirect route. You look at the consequences of rules to decide the right rules, and then you look to the rules to decide the right actions. One worry for this, though, is, well, what happens when you know that following that rule is going to lead to worse results? It looks like the point of consequentialism is, yet again, a means to an end of making the world a better place. But if that's the goal and you know you're not going to achieve those results um, by following the rule, it looks like he, that view is sort of self-defeating. You're thinking to yourself, well, look, I'm going to follow this rule because it helps me get to this sort of result. But in this case, it doesn't. That is, how can it be the right thing to follow that rule when it doesn't help you achieve the very goal of morality on that view? All right, but those are some of the replies that a consequentialist or utilitarian could try to give. So that's all for this video. Next time, we're going to introduce some cases for you to sort of reflect on and for thinking about maybe some of these problems with utilitarianism and for maybe to sort of initiate thought about how you might try to come up with an alternative moral theory that could avoid some of these problems. I'll see you then. Bye-bye.